The man named Christian climbed a great hill. On his back, he carried a great burden. Every mistake, every regret, every evil act, every sin which he had committed against humanity, against God, and against himself. It was a terrible burden, one which he could not get rid of on his own, so he climbed up the hill. As he climbed the hill, he saw a cross at the top. The burden weighed him down, dragging him away, but he would not give up. He continued up, and as he climbed, the straps of his burden began to burn away. One by one, the claws released him. When the last had fallen from him, the burden rolled down the hill into an open tomb, one empty of any body. Christian came to the top of the hill and cried for joy. This cry went far back to the city of Notkirst, bursting open the window which his wife sat beside, startling her. The cry went down in the court of Apollyon, prince of the city, who had screamed in anger, for this man was now free. Nihilism, to put it simply, is the belief that the world is meaningless. Nietzsche himself said that the world is meaningless without God, and I agree with him on this. If there is no God, no creator, no designator of meaning, worth, or purpose, then what meaning can we find in the world? So it's easy to say, futility of futilities. All is futility. There are two ways to take the truth of nihilism. The first is to create your own meaning apart from what everyone says. To say that you continue on in this world of hurt simply because you choose to. However tempting this is, it is the nine obvious facts of life. If you live for the moment, then you must either throw away any idea of financial security, dooming yourself to a life on the street, or you indenture yourself to a job which can barely keep up with your lifestyle. And living for the future means nothing if that future never comes because of things beyond your control, whether death, or theft, or something else. And whatever you leave behind, you have no control over what happens to it. You don't get to decide whether or not it's used rightly. No matter what people say, creating your own meaning is only denial. The second way to take the news that the whole world is meaningless without God is to accept it. This is wise, but it gives little solace on its own. We want purpose. We want meaning. There must be some reason I work so hard, suffer so badly, yet still choose to exist in this world. So what is it then? Is the universe merely cruel and uncaring, or is there a god? If there is a god, then this god must care enough about the universe to make it in the first place. And if god didn't make the universe, then why does he exist? And if he made it, then he must still care about it, at least as much as you care about an old drawing you made when you were six. And if he cares about what he made, then he must want justice. If someone hurts someone you love, you want to make sure they can't do that again. If men like Hitler and Stalin exist, then surely there must be some punishment for them. Therefore, this god has standards of morality. And this god knows your struggles. Do you remember what I said before? Futility of futilities, all is futility. Those are the first words uttered in a speech recorded in the book of Ecclesiastes, in the Bible, in the Old Testament. We believe Ecclesiastes to primarily be a speech written by King Solomon. Have you heard of him? Wisest man to ever live, and considered the richest by many. It was said he brought so many riches into his kingdom that only gold was used in the king's palace and not silver, which he had made far too common to be seen as valuable. Solomon was acquainted with every pleasure in life. He did everything. He amassed wealth, knowledge, works, wisdom, wives, and so much more. He did it all. And Ecclesiastes is him telling everyone what he discovered. It was all meaningless. Solomon takes 12 chapters to tell everyone that the world is meaningless without God. So he says to find your meaning in God. But I hear your objections. But God isn't real. Do you really believe that? If you look at the computer or phone you're using to watch this video, then you must think someone made this device. And it is far more complex than most people understand. 
We live in a world so complex that even scientists still don't understand everything. We still seek to understand the depths of the ocean and the stars in the sky. We still seek new medicines for ailments which have existed for thousands of years. So tell me that God can't be real. Now you might object to one issue or another, the LGBT issue, or abortion, or any number of things you've heard Christians object to. I ask you this. Wouldn't it be worth it to give these things up? If you could know the God who made you, if you could meet him and have a relationship with him, and be given meaning by him in an otherwise meaningless world, then isn't it worth sacrificing a few things for him? Isn't it worth sacrificing everything for him? These things are small compared to what awaits you if you put your trust in God. Are you afraid of eternity? I mean, living a life like the one you know might sound good to some, but terrible to others. Why be sad or in pain or hopeless forever? Hell is far worse than earth, and it is eternal, but heaven is eternal too. And while it's hard to imagine something better than this world, it is so much better. Imagine a world where people aren't bad to each other. You never go hungry, you never get sick, and no one ever dies. No anxiety, no sadness, no depression, all the wounds on your heart, your mind, your body are gone. You'll never make a mistake again. All this, you get to see God face to face. When I think of that, I don't need to be afraid of eternity. So can you make it to heaven? Ask God. If you're not sure, then read the Bible. If you can only read one book, read the Gospel of John. There you'll find this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that any who believe in him will not die, but have eternal life. And if you think that's not true, then please, don't just take it from me. Take it from historians of the time who weren't Christian, like the Jewish historian Josephus. He lived in the first century, likely at the same time as the apostles, like John, Peter, and Matthew. Not to mention the Roman historian and senator Tacitus, who was also born in the first century. They both said that Jesus was crucified as king of the Jews and rose again. And they weren't the only ones. So there is enough evidence and reason to believe not only that God exists, but that Jesus is who the gospel says he was. So what does this matter to you? So what do you get out of it? Do you remember what I said at the start about the man named Christian? You get to be like him. Ask for forgiveness. Make a commitment to seek after Jesus and live your life like God wants you to live it. He'll help you to do it. Just ask. In this, you'll find peace. You'll find joy. You'll find purpose. You'll find self-control. And so, 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 so much more. Will all your problems go away overnight? No, but they won't seem so big anymore. Not when you know God is watching out for you. And yes, he is watching out for you. He always is. Don't delay. Not with your eternity at stake. Start now. Put your trust in Jesus and start the first day of your new life today.